as mentioned in the <coughs> last lecture that is in the last class we would like to look at the central force problem by using the hamilton jacobi formulation so the central force problem in its simplest form is where we have a particle which is experiencing a force from a particular source and this force depends only on the distance between the particle and the source. Now let us suppose uh, for simplicity that the particle is moving in a plane. We know that in central force problem the closed trajectories are in a plane. So we are essentially taking it for granted that uh, the angular momentum perpendicular uh, angular momentum along a particular direction would be constant so that the motion remains confined uh, within the plane perpendicular to it. So for that the Hamiltonian would be uh, simply given by where this is our source and here is let's say a particle at a distance r and this angle is theta and the Hamiltonian describes the energy of the particle. This being time independent of course it is a constant of motion. Now as you can see the potential being only a function of r, the Hamiltonian is cyclic in theta. So as we discussed in the first lecture that for all such cases the Hamilton's characteristic function could be written as one function which depends on r and the other constant part, I mean uh, the other other part for the cyclic coordinate could be simply written as some constant times the coordinate. Now, this is the form that we have already established and we are now using the fact. As such Hamilton's equation of motion, uh, not Hamil Hamilton Jacobi equation in this case would be simply 1 by 2 m and then p r square would be del omega 1 del r square because this alpha theta and theta it is not a function of r and then p theta square by r square. So what would be the uh, value of p theta? Well a simple p theta is by definition so as such this would be simply alpha theta. So we have is equal to okay, let me move it slightly we assume the alpha 1 to be the constant equal to the total energy so in this case we are just following the notation of course time now this equation a simply function of r and we can rearrange that easily and then we take the positive square root as before and as such omega 1 would be simply given by the square root alpha 1 minus p r minus that's it. 
so i mean uh, that means i mean we, we we are not carrying out the integration yet but we we'll, would like to write down hamilton's characteristic function that would be simply omega 1 plus and this would be That's it. So once we know W, the Hamilton's characteristic function, then we have seen, uh, we have already did it in one of the previous lecture, that our new coordinate, uh, so called Q, uh, that would be uh, simply a constant and that would be given by the new Hamiltonian with respect to I mean that would be given by actually del s del w1 which of course I mean using the definition it would be simply uh, because you remember that we wrote s to be equal to w minus alpha 1 t using our logic that if Hamiltonian is time independent then the characteristic function could be defined which is just simply a part of the Hamilton's principal function and the difference being the total energy times time. So uh, from this it is straightforward that we have t plus beta 1, beta 1 being the constant of integration would be del w del alpha 1 but w we already have this expression. So, uh, if we carry out the differentiation, then what we have is so this is one of our equation. What about the other one? The other Q will also be a constant. So that would be simply this is our new momentum remember using our signs. Now, look at the last equation. The last equation gives us a clear relation between r and theta. So, as such, this last equation basically our orbit equation. As we mentioned earlier, one power of Hamilton Jacobi formulation is to give us the equation of the orbit without having to solve for the differential I mean uh, the dynamics so we do not need to know r as a function of t or theta as a function of t we can directly establish how r and theta are related to each other using the orbit equation now let's before we move on to another topic let's uh, just revisit what we did we defined Hamiltonian which is a function of r and it's cyclic in theta. As such, the Hamilton's characteristic function took a very simple form. It has one function which depends on r, the other function is some constant times theta. Now this form we have already seen in the class that in case of cyclic coordinate, the Hamilton's characteristic function is some constant times that particular coordinate. But that constant is the momentum in the sense that p theta in this case p theta would be del w del theta and that is equal to alpha theta so alpha theta being our uh, the momentum so theta being cyclic coordinate the momentum is expected to be constant 
So we just have a way of writing that and now we substitute the characteristic function in the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Once we do that then this w1 can simply be expressed as an integral over r. Then the total function, the total characteristic function is straightforward, the part of r and plus alpha theta times theta. Now once we have characteristic function, then we have seen our equation of motion particularly that can be easily written in terms of the new coordinates q. The new coordinate q or the del s del p, the p being the new uh, momentum. But we remember that we have chosen the first of our momentum to be the total energy and del s del alpha 1 is essentially del w del alpha 1 minus t because s is equal to w minus alpha 1 t. But w is already known and it is a function of alpha 1. So as such we carry out the differentiation, we can push the differentiation with respect to alpha 1 inside the integral and we get uh, the final form and this is the, our first equation. So r as a function of t could be established from the first equation. And the second equation is basically the other generalized coordinate that too is a constant because that is the advantage of Hamilton Jacobi formulation that our new coordinates after the canonical transformations are all constants equal to beta 1 and beta 2. Beta 2 is simply del w del alpha theta the other momentum and that too alpha theta the differentiation we can push it inside the integral and we get some form. We are not evaluating the integral because in many cases it is not easy and we are keeping it a, in a general form because uh, for a given v we can calculate. We are not assuming any specific form of the potential yet. So this is true for any central force problem. Now once we push the integral in and from the form of w we see the right hand side is a function of theta and r but that is essentially the orbit equation. So we see that we got the orbit equation and also one of the variable r as a function of theta. So in a way we have completed the uh, central force problem assuming of course the planar motion but what if it is not? Well the most general case it is just a one more step in the sense we write down the Hamiltonian as it's if the first two terms are same except we also have a phi dependent term now. So now we see the Hamiltonian is actually cyclic in phi. So as such we would say the Hamilton's characteristic function now would be one part having a function of r and theta. The other part would be simply alpha phi and phi this being a constant and this constant would be equal to p phi because we have So, phi being cyclic coordinate in the Hamiltonian it is expected p phi to be constant and we are calling it just alpha phi that is it. Now with respect to omega 1 let us look at the other part. The other part now looks like P phi is already alpha phi and R square is out so sin square 2 and this would be equal to alpha 1 the total energy the total energy being our you know 
first momentum in the new transform coordinate. Now look at this equation. This bracketed form it contains only theta dependent part. So we can write this theta dependent part and take everything else on the other side. Then we have argued that this theta dependent part must be a constant. It can't be a function of uh, I mean it, it can't be a function of anything else. So our argument that for each degrees of freedom the motion along the degrees of freedom could be separated provided we have relations like the partial derivative of the characteristic function with respect to that coordinate and any other function of that coordinate could be separated from the rest of the equation. So in this case I mean this let us say we call it uh, not phi uh, say kappa theta the bracketed part then we can write actually alpha 1 minus v into 2 m minus that is it or So we got it. Now you see we argued before that for arbitrary choices R, if the left side uh, has to hold for another arbitrary set of theta, then each side must be constant. So we argued that during the separation of variable. So as such, if this is a constant, then uh, let us say we choose alpha theta to be the constant. And then what we have? efficiency an equation I mean we are choosing this constant to be alpha theta square okay. so from this we can integrate and find the theta dependent part of omega 1 and similarly uh, this part this will be also equal to the alpha theta square so we will have our other equation would be like this is the other equation that too if we integrate we will get the r dependent part of w1 and they are simply additive so as such w1 would be like one part only dependent on r the other part which only depends on theta simply additive and we also have uh, i mean that's it and uh, talking about w w would be now the part of r then part of theta and then we already have the phi part that would be the form of w the remaining argument same as remains same as the you know the planar central force motion so essentially we will again get the orbit equation and other relations will stay same so we have seen that the hamilton jacobi equations help us uh, getting the orbit equation without solving the uh, actual problem the dynamics we don't without without solving the dynamical equation so this is one big advantage of the hamilton jacobi formulation so let us continue the discussion on action angle variables which we started in the last class but uh, I would like to begin with a quick summary. Suppose we consider a Hamiltonian 
for simplicity we are considering this Hamiltonian to be function of just uh, uh, just one generalized coordinate q and its canonical momentum p. I mean of course so all arguments could be extended to multidimensional cases but let's suppose we are considering only a one dimensional system this again this hamiltonian is not a function of time as per our assumption so let's say the total energy is constant and is equal to alpha 1 now this relation suppose we invert it Invert in the sense we can write p in terms of q and alpha alone. So you can see, I mean, the p would be a function of total energy. Now, a certain class of uh, mechanical systems, actually, uh, quite a few of them, uh, as we know, are periodic. I mean, we have uh, a regular uh, simple harmonic oscillator or harmonic oscillator per se, which are not simple or we have the planetary motion where the planets are orbiting around the star. So, in many cases, we do encounter uh, periodic motion and we kind of classified them. If you remember, we have libration where we have a closed trajectory in the phase space for p and q so q is periodic p is also periodic and we also had uh, rotation where p is periodic but q is not q can go from minus infinity to plus infinity the other example of uh, rotation uh, it is simple I mean if, a, if we have a pendulum which is rotating about say this particular axis uh, this particular point in this plane and this p theta this mean theta the p theta would be maximum when it passes through the lowest point and suppose it's say uh, rotating this way so at the highest point p theta would be minimal so p theta will have a maximum and minimum and it will have periodic variation as theta uh, keeps on accumulating on the other hand if this pendulum undergoes small oscillation so that means the theta is now bounded it goes from some minus theta naught to plus theta naught and uh, p is also similarly bounded in this case i mean p would be zero at the end point and will have maximum or minimum value at the theta equal to zero point so i mean for such cases the p would be maximum and minimum when theta or q is zero and p would be zero at the end points maximum q or minimum q maximum theta or minimum theta so uh, a pendulum can have libration or can have rotation depending on you know how we choose to rotate i mean to choose to move it i mean depending on initial condition essentially in any case uh, for such a pendulum uh, this relation can definitely be written that p would be a function of q and alpha 1 now as mentioned previously we can define a new variable j as an integral of p with respect to q over a complete period of rotation. Uh, this period is uh, the period of the p as we see it and Q could be bounded or unbounded, doesn't matter. We have to integrate over a period as the period defined with respect to P. Now, a, such a, an we would like to study some property of J and the Hamiltonian. 
Now you see, I mean, once we integrate this, this is basically the p is a function of q and alpha 1, alpha 1 being the total energy. Now, if we integrate over q over a complete period, then what remains is a function of alpha 1. So, j is a function of alpha 1. And if we invert this relation, then alpha 1 could be written in terms of j. So, it is already clear that this j would be a constant. So, we are essentially looking at the relation between two constants. One constant is alpha 1, which is the total energy. The other constant is something that we have designed, defined recently. Now, p dq, this integral, I mean, this product has the dimension of angular momentum. And we are evaluating this integral over a complete period to get this constant. So, this constant, I will repeat, this j is uh, integral over a period of p with respect to q. Now, p is a function of q and alpha 1. As such, the integration gives us a function of alpha 1. This, if we invert, then alpha 1 could be written in terms of j alone. But then alpha 1 is the total energy. So, that means that if we, if we choose, you know, new j as our new variable, then the Hamiltonian could be written in terms of j. That is a point that we would like to remember. Now, for this Hamiltonian, definitely the Hamilton's characteristic function would be a function of q and our new momentum which we can choose to be say j. So, the j would be our new variable. Okay. This is like a momentum uh, and uh, w being the Hamilton's uh, characteristic function. In that case, what would be the new generalized coordinate? Uh, that is simple. Uh, we will call it eta. That would be given by by definition. So, since w is a function of q and j, so this derivative will give us this eta, it will be also a function of q and j, is something uh, that we will remember, we will need this relation again. And what about the rate of change of eta? Uh, this is simple. So, rate of change of Hamiltonian with respect to j, just like we had q dot equal to del h del p. In such cases, actually, the k would be equal to h just by changing the variables. So, we, we use this Hamilton's equation of motion. So, eta dot would be given by del h del j. And remember that h could be written as a function of j. We already discussed that. So, this derivative will be let us say some constant, we call it nu and it will again be a function of j. So, if it is a constant, then it would be nu times t plus some integration constant, straightforward. So, we defined two, vari we defined a new variable j having the dimension of angular momentum and it is canonically conjugate variable, the coordinate which is eta, which is nu times t and there is some constant. So, so far it looks like just a bit of mathematics, some new variable, I mean, but the real advantage we will appreciate that the moment we look at the physical interpretation of it. So, eta is a function of q and alpha 1, but alpha 1 is a function of j. So, I mean, uh, we already discussed that eta is a function of q and j. As such, we ask the question that how does eta change when the system moves through one period, which means we would like to 
integrate this over a full period but then uh, this being eta being a function of q and j is constant so d eta as far as this uh, uh, with respect to period goes then del eta del q d q would like to reduce this relation so we will have del eta del q d q we would like to evaluate that but remember how did we get eta eta was del w del j so the derivative of Hamilton's characteristic function with respect to our new variable j. So we substitute that to get the partial derivative with respect to j could be taken outside the integral after all the integration is only with respect to q. And what is del w del q? By definition that is p. So we have the change of eta over a complete period is 1. So eta is more like keeping count. So now let us look at the two facts. Over a period the change of eta is 1 and eta is given by nu t and some constant. So if t is a full time period then I mean if we if we define the change in eta because we are changing time by a full time period then from these two relations it is clear that Delta eta is nu times t, t being the total time period, but then delta eta for a single time period is 1. So, which means nu is the frequency of the motion. So, I mean, this is a quite useful uh, information that we find the frequency. The frequency relation can be uh, directly written as. So just to look at the derivation once more that we found our generalized coordinate eta and we found its rate of change is given by nu. Nu is a function of j. It could be constant or is a, I mean in general is a function of j. So as such nu as a function of time is I mean eta is a function of time is nu t plus beta. And we found that nu to be the frequency, then eta is like an angle, angle in the sense that uh, you will appreciate it better that suppose we calculate this 2 pi eta constant, this is like an angle theta, this is like frequency angular frequency times time and uh, some initial angle let's keep calling it beta prime so we see i mean although uh, there is a factor of 2 pi missing but still we call it the angle variable and the j remember this is uh, you remember our abbreviated action abbreviated action was given by this form. So motivated by this j is called the action variable. So we have two variables one is action variable the other is angle variable. The variables as such themselves are not very interesting I mean they do not uh, give us any new insight except this one. This nu is the frequency of the motion and we can calculate that from this relation. So we see that in many cases we do not have to solve the equation of motion if we want to know 
the frequency of a periodic system all we need is we need to calculate j express hamiltonian in terms of j and from there find out the frequency let's let's try it out we would like to try one example let us suppose we have this harmonic oscillator here omega naught is the frequency but suppose i mean this is already given i mean you might think that this is already known all right i mean so if it is known we should be able to find it uh, using this formalism our expression finally should tell us that nu should be equal to omega naught by 2 pi this is what we are supposed to i mean this is what we supposed to find so let's try that so this let's say it's constant it's not a function of time so hamiltonian is constant right so in that case we would have to calculate j and j would be we have to integrate this over a period p dq now from this relation it is easy to see that p square would be twice m alpha 1 minus m omega square q square so it would be twice m alpha 1 1 minus right so let's call it a a square in fact and we have something like this so p we are just keeping it the positive square root why you choose uh, only the positive square root because in phase space uh, this would be a closed trajectory in this case we already know that for this closed trajectory choosing positive p is like choosing a particular direction along which along this direction the particle moves but then choosing i mean if we choose the negative one it would just move in the opposite direction but what we are interested in uh, is the frequency or the nature of the trajectory so as such the positive or negative roots they just merely change the direction without changing the essential physics so any of the sign would be good enough all right so if this is p then what would be the value of j well we can certainly take this constant out and would like to calculate this now uh, we can use i mean this being a periodic system and in this case we know that q is periodic too so we can use a substitution like so with this substitution with this substitution we have and if we include the definition of a as defined here the 2 alpha 1 by m omega square and a bit of algebra will give you i think equal to or so you see I mean the alpha 1 being the total energy 
the Hamiltonian as a function of j is simply omega naught j by 2 pi and like we missed this not here everywhere yeah okay let's correct it now so that's it which means the frequency that we wanted to calculate that we get a simple partial derivative with respect to j and that is equal to omega naught by 2 pi exactly what we wanted to calculate now this particular problem you see we calculated frequency using a mechanical procedure mechanical procedure in the sense that first you calculate pdq and you write p from the hamiltonian in the sense that the hamiltonian is given which is a function of p and q and is a constant as such p can be written as a function of q and alpha 1 then you substitute that to calculate your action variable then hamiltonian can be written in terms of the action variable alone for the simple reason this is a some function of alpha 1 and that can be inverted alpha 1 could be written uh, in terms of j but then this being the total energy so we we are essentially writing the total energy in terms of our new coordinate j so corresponding variable is the angle variable and its rate of change is given by a constant which is nothing but as we calculated before or showed before is the frequency so in this procedure you see the only challenge is to find this integral apart from that the rest of the procedure is simple and often in many situation we would like to know the frequency of the motion so this is one uh, very useful way of finding the uh, finding the frequency of the motion finding the frequency of the periodic motion without having to solve the dynamics so the biggest advantage of hamilton jacobi formulation and this action angle variables are that they give us the method of calculating the trajectory or finding out the frequency of periodic motions without having to solve the differential equations.